to know that you're here. Either you're too, you must be too hungry for God or you have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> One of the two, it can't be, it can't be third or fourth. So we want to thank God that all of you are here. And uh, I believe that God is going to bless us tonight. My wife is here as well. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you because you deemed it worthy that we'll be in your presence today to share, to talk about your word and who you are. And like the words that have come before, I believe that seeds are going to be planted tonight that are going to echo through eternity. They are going to change our lives for good. In Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. Amen. You know, the, I, I always tell people, and I think even last Thursday, those of you who had any chance to listen to the sermon, um, it is very easy to miss God. It's very easy to miss God. And when we talk about missing God, it does not necessarily mean missing a prayer meeting because there are people who miss prayer meetings but have not missed God. You see? But when we talk about missing God, we mean not being available to Him on the time He has appointed in your destiny to mark you for the next place of His purpose. Did you understand what I just said? Because much as the Bible says his mercies are new every morning and he loads us daily with benefits, all of us, I believe in our work of salvation, we will have certain milestones on our destiny like line. And these are by God designed to plant something in your life to propel you to the next place of purpose where you must be with him and some places are bigger than other places praise the Lord Jesus Christ some places are bigger than our credibility some places are bigger than our credentials some places are bigger than our education you know, our degrees, our masters, our PhD, some places are bigger. I went to school too, had a wonderful degree, banked for six years, thought that that was the way I should go, and things started turning. Are you following? And then I met something bigger. I met something banking would never give. I don't know, my mic is sounding so interestingly. I don't know what's wrong. And, and then I met something that I did not expect. I have always told people that if you told me that I was going to be a preacher of the gospel, <laughs> I would even think you hate me. You know, because some of us, I never admired ministers. I, eh, eh, my experience is about being men of God. Eh? Some of us, they had come up here they had come up here. But um, I'm here preaching. <laughs> and right now, it's I could never substitute it for anything in the world. Never. Because of what God has given me by Christ. And I would lose everything. You see, when Paul says, Many people don't understand this. Paul says that I was circumcised on the eighth day. This is Paul speaking. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Everything Paul is speaking was a qualification in his day. Okay? It was a qualification in his day. Like you'd have your definition of a qualification in their day. Okay? Your day, you know, when they say you're a magistrate. You know, that's a qualification, you know. He's a doctor. That's a qualification. He's this and that. Many things qualify us. For example, you know, some people are royalty. They come from, you know, the royal family. 
And that in its own comes with its what? Qualification. Mumbeja. So, so they say, you know, princess. Mlangira, uh, prince. And then, uh, you know, there, there are those that come with education. There are those that come with elevated status. Many things and many ways. Mm. Eh, Jesus. But the problem is you can't live. You've been there. That's my spiritual son called Ezra. He can stay there until I finish. So, may I continue? And so many qualifications in life come with many things. Okay? So, when Paul tells you are circumcised on the eighth day, something qualified him. Huh? And he says, I was of the stock of Israel. Something qualified him as a what? As a Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Something qualified him in there. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As touching the law of Pharisee. There was a qualification there. The problem is many people cannot see that because they do not know what it took to become a Pharisee. Let me explain. This man was born in Tarsus, Cilicia, which was no mean city. Okay? And the scriptures tell us that he was taken at the age of about 15, 16 to sit under one of the greatest law teachers called Gamaliel. And not only was he among the greatest, I mean, was he seated under the greatest teacher, the scriptures tell us that he excelled more than all his peers in the teaching of Judaism. If he was a student, Paul was a first class student. He was not a mediocre, he was not a past student, he was not a survivor. Paul was a first class student. He says, I profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals. Give me the amplified of that, Galatians 1.14. He says, and you have heard how I outstripped many of, many of the men of my own generation among the people of my race in my advancement in the study and observance of the laws of Judaism. So extremely enthusiastic and zealous I was for the traditions of my ancestors. This guy had qualified in every aspect that you would know. So if you have a degree, you're not the first. If you pass LBC, you're not the first. If you have a master's from Cambridge, you're not the first. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go back to where he was. So he was, as touching the law, he was a what? He was a Pharisee. Verses 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But he says, but of all those things that were gained to me, he said, I have counted loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. And he says, for whom I have suffered all things and do count all things but done that I might win him. Somebody shout hallelujah. That I might win him. Now by the time a man makes that kind of statement, that kind of bold statement, to say I have counted loss, it I mean that he does not recognize their place in his journey of purpose. But it only means that he has found something way higher than any credential would ever give him. And he called that the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He didn't call it the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He called it the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why would he count all things but down? Why would he belittle them even though they were great? Because Paul had a true vision of God. Somebody asked me a question today and said, what causes a person who you see in church, praying, fasting, doing all that you know is necessary, and then one day something happens, and this person backslides and then leaves the church and goes back to do everything they used to do or even worse? And I answered them and I said to them, they did not have a full vision of who God was. Because let me tell you, when the Bible says that no man can see God and live, many of us are not cognizant of the death with which we die when we carry the revelation of God. So when Paul says that I am dead to the world and the world is dead to me, by the time a man goes back to the very world he lived once without any second guessing or hesitation because somebody stumbled him or he 
something happened in his life or personal life and then you see them live a life and then they go back and you've had people who backslide you see I told people that from my consecration in my university it should have been my first year into the second year I've never backslidden I, I can't understand how and yet I do not judge I'm not speaking here from a place of judgment but I don't see how I can just wake up and turn a certain life because of what I saw in God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So I, I, I'm not saying that you should judge anybody who has backslidden or who has failed or fallen along the way because you don't know their journey and where God is dealing, you know, leading them to. However, I don't understand how somebody has seen God a certain way even in the deepest weakness you have to backslide is another thing. When we see people, somebody was with you, you prayed with them, and some of you bear record, you fasted with somebody, they were on the front line of service, and then tomorrow you hear that they've pulled the plug and they want nothing to do with God. Recently, I was somewhere at a restaurant, I met a young man of a church who used to go back in the day, and the boy said he no longer believes in God. Yet, where we were at, the pastor used to send people to, to him to prophesy on them. You understand? He was the prophet. So how a man who used to hear God for the destiny of others woke up one day and said that I no longer believe in God, it only means that, you see, we confuse so much on what happens on us with what happens in us. The anointing without and the anointing within are two different experiences. And that is something I wish had, I had time to explain. That, that many people understand the anointing without okay that thing that functions through the gifting of the spirit to minister to many and and it comes with so much power it comes with so much influence it comes with so much attraction if you might call that spiritually but that thing which happens within has a different language it has a different experience and comes with a certain authority and then one day i promise i'll teach about it deeply but um have you ever been in a place where a man is performing a miracle or walking in a prophetic, but there is no presence to what they are doing? Have you ever been in a place where there is no presence to what they are doing? You, you, you see the effect of the gift, but you don't sense the power that does that kind of gifting because it's not carried from the authority of the anointing within. See, when a man has been taught in the way of the Lord and they are functioning with the teaching of the Lord, it's different from a man who is simply functioning from a gift that has been bestowed on them. And those are different realms. But I was sharing with somebody last evening and I told them many people don't understand that difference. The people we minister to don't understand that difference. You see, they think that a man is anointed because he prophesied or healed a sick person. No, that level of anointing exists. But there is an authority that only a person can have because they have built a certain relationship with God. Somebody shout hallelujah shout glory to God so Paul here as I go into what I'm supposed to teach tonight Paul here is saying that I, I did everything that would have given me credential in my day but I counted loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ and I say he could not have just done that because that was a choice so that's something Gamaliel told him he must have done that because he had a certain vision of God when you see God, again I say, when you have a certain vision of God, it's amazing the things that start melting before you. It's amazing the things that you're willing to give up or the things that you will live without, which at one particular point you thought you'd never live without. You know many people in this room on a Saturday at this time, you'd be so high. Come on. You'd be so high, you would not even know whether the, 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 now it's, you'd see cars moving right. You'd see keep right instead of keep one. Left. But hallelujah, you are here on a Saturday afternoon. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. So today, I wanted to read for us something I've, I know many of us have read before. In Hebrews 19, Paul brings a conversation that I have shared a sermon about, but today I want to take another direction of this understanding. In Hebrews chapter 9, 
uh, Paul is speaking about a certain dispensation, and if you will read with me in the KJV from uh, verses uh, 6, we see God has brought his presence uh, to mankind. Something that mankind can what? Come in contact with. Something that man can connect with. Because it's one thing to believe or relate with a God whose address you cannot find. Eh? So in this instance, God wants to give the children of Israel some sort of address. And out of the instruction he has given in how they should build this temple, by reason of their obedience, he has allowed them that presence. And so we can all agree that the deepest presence that was manifested at one time on the earth, it was through the tabernacle. You see, it was a tabernacle, if you recall very well. Holy place, outer court, holy of what? Holies. So God here, in this uh, portion of scripture, Hebrews 9, he's actually talking about the presence. He's introducing to us a certain understanding concerning the presence. So as I'm preaching, in the back of your head, keep that mental note of the presence. Because this is what he gave man. This is what they could relate with. And a man would enter the Holy of Holies once a year. And all their sins are forgiven. How much presence do you think you need to wipe a, I mean to cover every man's sin in a nation? Marakote. You understand? It's a lot of power. But because in that Old Testament experience, their issue was sin. In the Old Testament, the issue was sin. And, and I want you to understand that. Because the Bible says sin disturbed relations. Isn't it? Sin disturbs relations. So if we're talking about a relationship with God, the Bible says sin disturbed relations with God in everything. And everyone, you see, it disturbed relations. Okay? I want to relate with God. I want to have a love relationship with God. I want to be able to, to, to connect to God. I want to be able to walk or function under a certain presence. But I'm living under a sin. And so there was a very huge thing disturbing right there. There was a huge disturbance right there. Why? There was no redeemer. There was no redemption. You see? The high priest goes in the, high, in the Holy of Holies once every year to make sure, the Bible says, to cover their sins. To cover, not to take away, to cover. Oh Lord, we recognize that the sins are there, but let us cover them. That's what the high priest used to do. To do every year. You see? Until more are done. And when they are done, again the relationship is what? It's disturbed. So they are living in a dispensation where their relationship with God is disturbed every now and then. And every year, a priest goes in there to make sure that he can bring some sort of covering and with that sort of covering sort of calm down that, that heat eh, between God and man such that they can carry some sort of relationship that if they pray or make some prayer God will hear. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, in Hebrews 9 God is talking about that example of presence that was with, with them. And the Bible speaks, if you read from the uh, verses 1, he will explain to you what was of that sanctuary and what it was. But verses 6, he says, after the conclusion of explaining everything that was in that sanctuary, the Bible says, now when these things were thus ordained, when they were ordained, the priests went always in the first tabernacle, that is the Holy of Holies, accomplishing the service of the Lord. But into the second, no, the holy place, sorry. And into the second, which is the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone, the Bible says, every once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Verses 8 says, this was all a signification that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. God is saying that the reason why there was only one man who used to go in the presence of God to access the deepest presence of God for the covering of their sins 
While that remained, there was a very deep significance that the manifestation of his presence was not clear, or that the presence of God, the power of God, was not a manifested reality to Israel. It was only exclusive to one man. You can just imagine how God has put the deepest presence somewhere, and only one guy understands how it functions. And that fellow also accesses that presence once a year. And every time he goes into that presence, he just goes to cover you and your sins. Because he was also a human being, the Bible says his sins were covered. He, he went with, with, with what? With, with the sacrifice of blood. Not only for him, the Bible says, but also for those whom he was what? Representing. The deepest presence on the earth was visited only one year, one t once a year. And whenever it was entered, this man enters to deal with his sin and the sin of others. And once God would confirm to him that now I have covered, that man walks out. And there are times God was so angry sometimes that he would slay even the priest if this guy missed the order of some sort. And they tell you, those of you who have read the Bible will know, that they used to tie a rope on the high priest. So that when they pull and pull and pull for some time and this guy is not replying, Momanya, the guy has been slain in what? In the presence, you see? And then they pull out the body slowly. Sorry, he was a good man, you know? He was a good man. And then condolences come and, you know, eulogies of, you know, and then imagine that other priest who is selected after this one. <laughs> now those guys suffer. Imagine, you know, you say, you're the next priest. <laughs> Your fellow was just pulled out last week. Huh? So that means even the sin that you see in the world, as people are continuing to sin, you're like, huh? When I come back. You, eh? So if, if, if this was a presence that could kill, imagine how a man entered it. Just think for a moment how a man entered it. And this was the deepest place of the presence of God. So let's continue a little bit here. Now the Bible says, so this was not yet made manifest. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the holiest place was not a manifestation of revelation. And the Bible says it was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And God is trying to tell us here that in as much as this place is not a revelation, even the fellow, the priest representing them, comes out with the mind of the covering of their sins, but even they, as the children of Israel, their consciences are not what? Purged. They're, they are not delivered. That part in them that hears God, that part in them that should turn to God, is not converted. Why? Because this is simply something covering. They know the sins are covered. The conscience would, they would know that they are forgiven. They would not worry about the forgiveness. You see? But there's a part in, 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 in this when we speak of how the conscience is not perfected. It is because they needed to have connected to the presence of God beyond the forgiveness that they receive with him for the perfection of the conscience. Your law students, you should understand this. So, sorry, those of you who don't know English, Porsche, I was just telling them how I love to hear German. How it sounds good in my ears. So, now the Bible says, this imperfection stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Underline that, I'm going to emphasize so much there. So God says, you know, these people are, they don't have a revelation of the presence. And so to keep them in some order of worship, in some order of relationship with me, I have to let certain kind of ordinances in, imposed on them to sort of put them in some order. 
Uh, now, when we talk about carnal ordinances here, when you study the, 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 the Greek there, from where Paul is speaking, he's not just talking about carnality as of the flesh to be, because can, the word carnal there is not carnal like this person functioned in the flesh. No. But rather here, this carnality is that everything they were doing to connect to the presence of God touched whatever was outside. You understand? Certain meats, diverse washings, and I think you still know some, some people up to today who, before they go into the presence of God, they must get wudu. <laughs> Three times hands, ears, what? Yeah. So today I was at a wedding and I was greeting people and there was this lady who was covered. I forgot. I was shaking her hand. I remember, oh God, uh, how wudu has it has gone. <laughs> because when a man touches a woman who has received wudu, eventually she's unclean. I felt so sorry. Because I was greeting all her friends, hi, hi. And I just remember, she greeted me with this, like, don't, bruh, don't take this thing away. So, but, but, but there are people who are like that. And everything that they are doing is without just to earn a certain place with God. And God says, this they continued to do until the time of reformation. And here is, 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 is where I want to build my word tonight. That until the time when God brought a certain understanding to humankind, their revelation and understanding of the presence of God, the deepest presence of God that God would have sent on the earth, was firstly connected to by everything they did without. And as, as sad as that is, they still did not have a revelation of what the presence of God was or what it can do. What it can do. Until Jesus comes in a certain priesthood. So in part, when we talk about the life of salvation and the purchase of eternal salvation and you receiving the Lordship of Jesus Christ, sometimes we do not emphasize or we are not keen to teach what this was to mean concerning the interpretation, the understanding of the presence of God. The presence of God. When the Bible says that there's one glory of the sun and one glory of the moon and the Bible says and another glory of the stars for one star differeth from another star in glory. What does that mean? It means that every man in this room, even though you're all born again and you're children of light and you're born again, and you're all believers in Jesus Christ, I presume, or perhaps there's somebody who's not born again, we all differ in glory. We don't share the same grace when it comes to functional glory. We all defer. Oh no, when Jesus prayed that my glory have I given them, he gave the church. All of us carry the glory of Christ. And we can say that generically. Okay? But when it comes to the application and work and manifestation of that glory, we all defer in that glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? We all defer from that glory. A story spoken about, and I know some of you have read about it. When I, I, I just started reading this wonderful book called God's Generals, and I tell people that for me, after the Bible, there is no book that changed my life like a book called God's Generals. If you've never read it, look for it. Volume 1. It's a blue book. If you read it and it doesn't change you, chances are <laughs> ch 
chances are you might never walk a certain place. Because there are books in this world that are there to impregnate you. That when you read them, you must conceive whether you want it or not. You see? How would a woman enter a kitchen, Catherine Coleman? She's just going through. And there is cooks that are cooking. They don't know Catherine is in the kitchen. And the power of God slains everybody in that room. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you have read, I, I think I shared once of a story or twice, or a couple of times I think, of a man called Grandison Finney. This fellow built a certain presence around him. One day, his train, oh no, he, he was actually in a train, not his, he was just in a train. You know those New York trains that go through Manhattan and and as his, the, the train he was in was going through New York City on record, every man in the radius of about three or four kilometers was slain by the power of God. This was not a man praying. This was a man on a train just going through a city. Are you following what I'm saying? Just going through a city. That's, that's not something you can build through philosophy. No. That's not something you can build through vain jungling. Paul calls them endless myths and genealogies, which means the questions in the hearts of our hearers rather than godly edification, which is after faith. And to find that a man was born like you, went to school like you, had, you know, he, he, he became an adult like you, and he can connect to a presence that can arrest every human body in a radius of three or four kilometers. And they are all slain and hit because this man has connected to a presence that not many people are even know about. If that day fascinates you, then you don't even yet know why you are alive. Because imagine if that power entered our political world. Imagine if that power entered the judicial world. Imagine if that power entered the business world. Imagine if that power entered an institution. Imagine if that power arrested a nation. Imagine if that power entered anywhere. Anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with Satanists or you know this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Imagine if that power entered somewhere. And it was supposed to cause change. What would it do? Years ago, <laughs> I entered London College and I shared this story. The power of God hit kids and some were slain under the power of God for one week. That the university had to call me, I mean the school had to call me back. And they were asking me, what have you put in these children? And, and I'm telling them, no, there is nothing I've actually put in them. You have just lived in a world where you are not familiar with what the power of God can do. You see, we have people who have been raised so carnally, in a world so carnal. And some of us, like I, our foundations were religious. We never had any appreciation of what the power of God can do. And I asked them, and all of these children, by the majority of them, I can name one by one, they are all still born again in Christ and serving. Because this was not just power, it was transformational power. Somebody shout hallelujah. There was a girl in, in London College, she was a Sudanese girl, very, very, you know, she was one of those, ah, you know what I mean. And she entered the room and she was seated in the back and I will never forget, she was nicknamed Lady Gaga. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? She was nicknamed who? Lady. Lady Gaga. And she was one of the most notorious girls in London College. 
This girl got slain for a week. By the time Lady Gaga princess, <laughs> time Lady Gaga resuscitated, <laughs> resurrected, she was the most born again person you could ever find. <laughs> Le <laughs> Lady Gaga became a woman of God. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm talking about what? Power! You see, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 5, it speaks of people which have tested the good word of the Lord and the powers of the world to come. Underline that word called the powers of the world to come. Underline that word, the powers of the world to come. I'm not talking about the powers of the world you see now, present. The Bible says, Demas has forsaken me for the love of this present world. I'm not talking about the love of the world that you see present. I'm talking about the power of the world to come. What does it mean by the world to come? In there is a language trying to reveal that as the world evolves, certain realities are being sent in the earth through the understanding of the person of Jesus Christ that release nuggets or grains of reformation in the spirits of men which are available unto God. And to those men, the world to come not only belongs, but they have tested, they have an experience of the revelation of the powers that are going to be manifested in the world to come. The world to come. The world to come the world to come. He calls them the powers of the world to come. As the world evolves, expect more manifestation of God's power. As the world evolves, expect more manifestation of God's glory. When the Bible says that the glory of the latter church shall be greater than the glory of, of the former, he has set an indelible law in the spirit realm that as long as we are alive, a greater glory is going to appear tomorrow than there was today. A greater power is going to appear tomorrow as it was today. Some of you just don't see it. But that is the power that grows nations. That is the power that changes societies and communities. You see, I, I gave an example once, okay? The eons are changing things, okay? One, part, one day, uh, a, a, a bag of cement was 28,000 at one particular point in life. 25, 23,000 at one particular point in life. Those of you who build, how much is a bag of cement now? 36, 37, you see? Something has increased the price of the bag of cement. That your president, don't even be deceived, he has no control over that. You see what I'm saying? Fuel was costing us at two or three thousand dollars. I mean two or three thousand shillings at one point. Fuel, now it's at six what? Six thousand what? I don't know. You see? But it's above six thousand, I believe. Now, at one particular point, the, the power on, in your world would buy a liter of petrol at 2,800. In this world that you're living in right now, the power that is available has raised the price of fuel at 6,000 shillings a liter. And while there are men who are, not able, who are not able to buy that fuel, there are people in the same dispensation who have the power to buy that fuel. Do you believe it? Do you understand what I'm saying? They have the power. For some reason, maybe their income allows, their businesses allow, their transactions allow, their status, their community, I mean, in community allows, whatever it is, but something allows them to buy. And there are people who have parked their cars because they no longer can afford 6,000 shillings for a liter. Do you agree? Yes. Now, that's just fuel. What about food prices? Okay? Some of you are 90 bones, never understand. Even me, born in the 80s, I, I'm also starting to feel like, yeah, I have things to say. <laughs> As a time we were the example, now we also have things to what? <laughs> to say. One time, I remember there was a time where you could eat lunch 
at 1,000 shillings. And that lunch would come with meat, spaghetti, some chapati. Come on, help me somebody. Do, do I have a few people who understand my world? Over you are in the 90s, these 90s. You see, the, the, you, you'd, you'd buy chapati, you'd buy meat. The woman even adds some beans. <laughs> like, mm, you're my custom every day. <laughs> you remember those days? Some of us saw those days. When I was in campus, I mean, a meal, 2,500, my goodness, it was all food. <laughs> they said, put on all food and meat, beans, what, dinner. That one you could have the cornucopia. <laughs> you see? But now I can tell you, you hardly can find a meal that gives you everything at 1,000 shillings. You see? No, some people can access it. There are people here who are in, still in 92. You see them there, but there's a world where they have that provision. I don't know how, but, but, but you hardly can find a meal at 1,000 shillings, isn't it? That means that there is a power that has pushed the price of food. Okay? There's a power that has pushed the price of what? Of food. Now, the, the, generally speaking, people are saying, ah, you know, food prices, oh, this has raised and this has gone up, and granted. But what people are not understanding is that the world is evolving and it, it is calling, it, it, is, it, is, it is aligning itself to certain powers in a certain world where some of the things that you're able to afford now, you might not be able to afford tomorrow. Some of you who read are already seeing how far the world is going now, with artificial intelligence. The other day I was reading among the top five professionals, professions that are going to be immensely affected in the next 10 to 25 years and lowers the first. <laughs> Do you agree? But when you were younger, you wanted to be a what? A lawyer. Congratulations. <laughs> Your dream has come true. I'm happy for you. You see? Now, while your parents were paying these fees for you to go to law school and do all of these things, somebody was creating a world where he was going to disrupt your education and your system like you know it. And that is powers of the world to come. Now, in a physical sense, because whether you want it or not, that idea in him to disrupt your system comes from the spirit realm. It wasn't a physical thing. It, it, the, the function of that was an importation of something in the spirit realm. Are you following what I'm saying? So chances are that even the greatest students that we have here today, maybe in a few years to come, they might not be employed unless they evolve. As of whether in that evolving they will adapt and find themselves in the world where the language spoken will apply to their credentials or as of whether some will divert and join preaching like me, because that, that's that one, they didn't, it wasn't among the, <laughs> wasn't among those, <laughs> yeah, because artificial intelligence cannot rub adego shika, sotalabadega sorogoto, no artificial intelligence can't, nah, praise the Lord, algorithm cannot be tuned to speak in tongues and, and, and connect to the spirit, these are heart issues. Somebody shout hallelujah. And, 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 and again, let me encourage you. Whatever happens, you, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. Don't worry. Your pattern, Lord, is already ordained somewhere. In Jesus' name. So, like, like I was saying, so uh, a lot is going to change. Like we, we, we see, some of us have had what they call the Great Reset. It started... He started cryptocurrency. Now it's defining another, f another form of promissory note, money. You see? And it's reconciling the language of money. When somebody has a Bitcoin, crypto, wherever they will be, whatever value it carries is the same for every value of any currency in the world. You see? Today our prevalent you know, uh, 
currency is a dollar and everything is charged or debated and valued against that. But in a couple of years to come, might not be now, it's okay. See, governments are, come, are trying to come to terms because they don't understand how they'll deal with that. But whether you want it or not, somebody designed it. It is starting. It's creeping in unawares. It might take 20, 30 years or 40 years, but whatever you, whenever, it doesn't matter how long it does, one day the conversation of money, especially to our children, will be different. They'll find it so hard when you show them on paper and tell her, with this one, I could buy a meal. I see those days when I'm trying to explain to my daughter, no, here, this one, we could buy food. Hey, with this paper. Yes. Wow. Then she looks through it. Those are, those are salient features. You understand? Now that world has what? Has gone. But much as the world is creating and evolving and adapting and mutating, don't be mistaken that heaven is quiet. Somebody shout hallelujah. Something is being arrayed and aligned for us and it connects to the presence of God that we should know. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 2 verses 5, the Bible says it's not unto the angels that he has put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. He has put the world to come in our subjection. He has chosen us to be ahead and leaders in the world to come. The whatever comes, let it come, but God has put you ahead in whatever should come. That means you're not going to be a survivor in the next world. You're not going to be a victim in the next world. You're not going to suffer in the next world. And God is giving us the secret, the mystery, his presence. That is why I'm going to warn you very clearly that the years and months and weeks that are coming are going to be so dangerous for a man who does not know how to connect to the presence of God. There was a time it was okay. We were indifferent. But whatever Saturday is doing in the world, recently the Lord, these are things I hate speaking about, recently the Lord I, in prayer, the Lord started to show me how much the sons of wickedness have started to open up in the spirit realm. The portals that they are opening up through sorcery and witchcraft and how much demonic activity is coming into the earth as many of the shields that God had designed for our preservation have been broken into and men are creating portals. Guys that are doing witchcraft right now you know, uh, the, the, there's, uh, I don't know that some of you have heard of the science where they want to resurrect. These guys went and dug out, um, went, you remember, you remember those days of the flood? These guys went and followed the story, identified the geographical place of where these guys would have died, and dug out a version, I mean, a, 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 a bones that I believe to have belonged to one of the fallen giants. Gil Gilgamel? Has any of you heard about that? Where do you live? <laughs> now, these guys, through this idea of, um, uh, what do they call that? Cloning. And what? Eh? Eh? Because remember, by 2045, by 2040, people are going to be able to create human beings through machines with the choice of genes you want them to have. I was watching a, a, a documentary some time back and this doctor, interesting guy, was saying that by about 2040, somebody's going to walk into a hospital and say, I want a son six feet and three inches high. I want him to be blue-eyed. I want him to have Caucasian hair or black hair or curled hair. I want, uh, I want him to be a sportsman. I want and everything you want because they have already sequenced genes and can know which gene does what. They inject it in this being until they create exactly the kind of child you want. Where we're going by 2040, they'll be able to create a child for two men by simply taking their hair strands. They cut hair from one man, cut hair from another, extract DNA, and then design a child for both. You see where I'm coming from? 
And as crazy as that, sound, as that sounds, some people will even choose to say, why should I go through gaining weight, six months, cut. You understand what I'm saying? Yet they can simply cut your hair, cut mine, and then design our baby the way we want our baby. And me, I have a big nose. I don't want a big nose. And then they adjust the child by gene editing. That's where we're going. Transhumanism now is on its way. They are, they are, they are building human beings with robots and robots to human beings, uh, synchronizing them in a way where <laughs> these guys are literally messing with the very image of God. They are creating their own image. Some of you have read now Scientists are the final stage of storing memories. Like somebody gets to a place of death before they die, they put something on your head and pull everything out of you and keep it and store it like on a hard drive or something. And then they find a way to connect it to some sort of machine so that even though your soul has gone to heaven, it's as though you're on the earth, you are function as a human being, your memory was stored and it can be plugged into some machine and you, you function. You get it? Now, I don't even want to go there. I mean, your lawyers, you see? So, I don't even want to go there. Eh? Ethical questions. With your suits. Ethical questions. <laughs> I know how you think. I even fear you. I'm married to one. So, the <laughs> sorry, my wife. Sorry, I just passed out. I don't know how. <laughs> so, but, but are you following what I'm saying? But the Lord started, I was in some place of prayer, and then the Lord started to show me how much has been open, you know. And then you see, some of you are just seeing the legislations that are being passed in the world. You go to America and ask yourself, what are these guys actually thinking? But whether you want it or not, there is demonic activity. This demonic activity, folk are, de are possessed by some random demonic operation. And whether you're talking of senators, you're talking of congressmen, you're talking of presidents now, people are functioning under something we don't have a name for. You see? And unfortunately, as that is happening, today in the church, the presence of God is leaving our altars. You understand what I'm saying? How's in one nation in America, and I'm preaching, Huge church of about 2,000 people, 1,500. And just third row, a guy is seated, is dressed like a woman. He has that evening cloak, beard. You know that beard? Eh? Of men where you cut. And then, you know, it's cut totally. But they will. They, they call four o'clock shadow. What are they called? They are called four o'clock shadow, five o'clock shadow. He, this guy is this, and then he's putting on a hat, then he's putting on a net, and then he's carrying a bag, and the guy has come to church, and he has come to pray. <laughs> so as I'm preaching, I see this guy, and, and, and I see the legs, <laughs> and as generous as God can be, the guy was endowed, you know. The day should come sooner where somebody just enters the presence of God and something hits him from that door. Gets slain for hours. By the time he's back into his senses, he knows who he is. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hmm. But also, you see this, this very tool, the law, you, that it is used. Don't even get me started. Because, wow. The law can redeem so much, but it can also destroy so much. You agree, eh? Hey, it can redeem so much, but it can also choose to destroy so much. As dealing with a spiritual daughter who went to law school, by the time she was finishing, 
<laughs> she didn't believe in marriage. I looked at this girl. You, you get where I'm coming from. Eh? Education, you see? Generally. And it's not only in your field. All the other fields have their what? Play. I'm just using examples because you're lawyers. N nothing personal. Again, I'm married too. But I'm trying to tell us that sometimes when I see the world to come, I wonder just how much the devil has built and invested and how much the church has built and invested. And we can only pray. I'm not saying that God is without a plan. I'm only saying not many people understand the seriousness of the world we're going to enter in the years to come. If a man or a woman does not have the tangible presence of God. That was back in the day it had to be for the pastor because he needed to pray for the sick. Now, wherever we are, whether you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be a this or you're going to be a minister in your government or you're going to be the president, probably is one here. Wherever God is going to put you, darkness has increased its works that the only way we can break the systems of this world is by some anointing. Whether you accept that or not, the things that are coming and the things that some of us have started to see. Recently I was sharing with people about why today many kids are being diagnosed with bipolar. Almost every week of my life I'm praying for a child with bipolar autism. Those of us who are of the 90s, 60s, 70s, that was a rare thing. Is it because we have more people on the earth? No. But how come we pray for them and some of them manifest demons? And they speak through them. That means there's a lot of demonic activity that is happening in the world. You see what I'm saying? It can sit on a whole parliament and they pass something that can destroy a generation. The decisions that are being made in Europe and in America and don't think they are far from our nation. No. Anytime they are going to come knocking, unless some of us understand exactly what God has called us to be and do, and to connect to a power that can actually change things. Somebody shout hallelujah. And connect to a, a power that can actually align and calibrate things, and connect to a power that we know can undo what the devil has done. He's talking about reformation. And you cannot talk about, talk about reformation without the revelation of a certain presence. Without the revelation of a certain presence. Without the revelation of God to a certain degree. And this is what the Lord told me. Of course, he's raising men and women from different places. By the way, even though madness is in the world, the world has never prayed like it's praying now. On the other hand too. Much as people might not see so much, but the hungry are really what? Hungry. The thirsty are really thirsty. When we say we're believing God for revival, some of you should understand what we mean. We're not just saying we want people born again and people healed. No. We want a certain presence in our generation. Like has never been seen in any generation. I'm talking about a power that can change even the most difficult things. In the simplest way. Because a man has learned to relate with God. I told people in my university days. I remember we in a room of were four, the three ladies and I, and we, we I just gone because as a as a papa in that in, in, in one of those I go to this hostel to greet some Kenyan ladies to say hello to them, the three girls. Just hi you guys, are you okay? And then as we were talking, you, are you are you okay? Are you guys okay? Jesus entered the room. Now I don't know how to explain that. 
Jesus entered the room. And all of us knew he had entered. Now, it doesn't mean that he's not indwelling. No, we're talking about him creating an encounter for us for some specific purpose. That's what I'm talking about. So he enters the room. And the presence of God increased in that room like I had not, I had not seen or tested. I'd had encounters with Jesus a few times, but this was something that was unusual. The presence of God came in that room. We were not crying, but it, would, it, it, it was like as if somebody had cut onions. Eh? And there was a, a heat that came with so much power. And then we broke into tongues. And broke into tongues. And prayed. And I could sense. All of us could sense it was there. And then there's this lady I shared. It was a girl called Mary. And then Jesus started to speak. And the power of God was upon her. Why in that room? And this girl read my life from the day I was born to the day I will die. You understand? When you discover that you're that marked by God, you can't just wake up and live no more. I no longer have the opportunity, quote and unquote, to live no more. Because I have been in a room where somebody read my life from the day I was born to the day I will die. That's how you realize the seriousness of God with you. Some of you think you're just, you, know, you go to school, you love Jesus, you know you're born again. But have you even understood what your life could have looked like? You see, some of you one day when you get to heaven, the biggest stroke of your life will be that video of what you could have been will be that video of what you could have been. God will eventually show you and tell you you could actually have done this in the world. You could actually have changed your nation. You could actually have shaken your generation. You could actually have done this. You could actually have done that. Because I see and I know, I understand. There are many people who live very normal lives, unpredictable lives. They, they, they don't know even where they're going tomorrow. They don't even know where they're going today. They fall in love like that. They come out like that. They have kids like that. They go to jobs like that. They switch decisions like that. Today they pray like that. Tomorrow they don't pray like that. Like nothing on their lives is calibrated to will and purpose. And yet much as you might live in that laxity, God is damn serious with your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And then we are amazed that the God speaking into our destinies at that particular point. And then you realize, oh my God. God is actually more serious about me than I actually what? Thought. And as you continue to see and God continues to reveal to you the liberties that are available. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. When you're chosen by God. I tell people, look at Samuel. Why would Samuel be restored? Why? Why would David be restored? And all the men that were chosen of God. Because when he chooses you, it doesn't matter how or where you go, he'll still take you back. He'll bring you. He restores his chosen. There's always a way for their salvation. There's always a way for their what? Restoration. God never chose Saul, Saul, right? That's why Saul was never what? Restored, because it was never God's choice. But when God has handpicked you and marked you, eh, you, you can spend years doing or oh, whatever you do, you know, dodging him, passing here, passing there, to them, praying tomorrow, I'm not. When God has marked you, there is eventually that day where you can no longer escape. Somebody shout hallelujah. That day comes where you can no longer give an excuse. That day comes where you can no longer act funny. That day comes where you can no longer act um, <laughs> philosophical. That day comes where you can no longer... It comes. It, it might take weeks, it might take years, it might take months. But when God has marked you, eventually one day he puts you where you must be. And then your eyes are open to the seriousness of his purpose on your life. One day one man prophesied on my life and told me something. And... and, and He spoke a lot and I was a bit young and not understood yet. And he told me, but one day you'll have moments where you just sit alone and start crying 
because you'll finally realize what God was up about concerning your life. She so said to explain to me, you know, there are those tears of I have a problem, what? No. But there's that overwhelmingness of, of, of when you finally come to the realization of actually how serious God was with you. And until one day, sometimes I'm driving in my car, sometimes I'm sleeping alone, and then these tears come, and I remember what that man said. And he said, you see, some of you, the way God has chosen you, the way God has marked you, the way he, he has, you know, set you up. You don't even have a clue. You think, ah, you know, I go to school, I go, you know, I love God. Yeah, but a time will come where you'll just sit there and just cry, not because you're sick, not because you have a problem, but because you understand the seriousness of his call on your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. The seriousness of his call on your life. So, sometimes I say, oh, now, some people say, oh, yeah, Fenero, oh, you know, 10, 15,000 people, oh, you know, this is people sitting, you know, I, on Thursday, I have more than 10,000 people sitting. But what does that mean? It's, it's not the 10,000 people sitting. It's the responsibility that I have in my time and what that means to the world, what that means to heaven, and why me? You see, so it's something every day I receive with so much grace and humility because it's something you never get used to. You can never get used to it because every time it's working, you can see that it's entirely God performing, fulfilling something way bigger than you. And then you get in stadiums and then the lame are walking like some of you saw in the anniversaries. The people are walking out of wheelchairs, teeth are growing and Tumors are disappearing. And, and these are things I read in a book. You understand? These are things we read in a book. And, and we used to think, do those happen? How? Thank you. How do those things even happen? And then they start happening with you. And God is trying to tell you, I am the same today, yesterday, and forever. And for the world to come, I have prepared way bigger than Paul would say. I have prepared way bigger than Peter would say. I have prepared way bigger than Jeremiah and Hezekiah would say. I have prepared way bigger than Elijah would say. I have prepared way bigger than Elisha would say. The world to come has greater power than many of us have read even in any book. So when I tell people that some of you think you've seen but you have not seen yet, I don't blame you if you don't believe it because you have lived in carnal ordinances for so long. Do this and do that and do this and do that. And that's all you know to do. And there's a man out there in the world who thinks that if I die and wear that rosary that day, God is not going to touch or move in his life. You see what I'm saying? He, they exist. People like that are there. And I don't blame them because that's where we are. Many of us, we have those ordinances. We just don't know that they are carnal. We just don't know that they are carnal. You see what I'm saying? But God is looking for a people, and I want to finish. God is looking for a people who are ready to seek his face. That's why I tell you people, I don't even know why I'm preaching this in a lawyer's fellowship. This is something I should have preached in a revival meeting. I don't know why I'm preaching it here. You know, when I, when I get into such days, I know that I am, I've come for one or two or three. <laughs> I, I know. I know when such days happen. Because some things, some things cannot just be preached, you know, on, 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 on certain platforms unless the Spirit of God is impressing you over somebody in this room listening to me right now and the words that I'm speaking were meant for you. Now, I want to finish. I sent the message to my generation more than ever before is that we should seek his presence like we have never sought it before. We should seek his presence like we have never sought it before. Whether you are qualified in whatever means and whatever God will give you because your star must shine anyway. 
I expect you to be judges tomorrow. I expect you to be the best lawyers the world has ever seen. I expect you. But we're not talking about that kind of lawyer who has made it because they, were, they naturally came from a smart family. No, I'm talking about that person who has made it because there was a certain anointing that churned the wisdom. That is not usual. That they're not in a courtroom because they can articulate and break the English right, but that they're in a courtroom because they have an anointing and a certain purpose. That far cuts, far cuts, just winning that case to aligning things for the bigger picture that only you who has related with God can understand. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Our generation should seek the face of God and position ourselves for the presence that is to come. The world that is to come is coming with great power. And the Bible says it's in subjection to us. We shall be above it. We shall speak upon it. We shall control things in it. We shall align things in it. We shall command things in it. We're not going to be surviving in that world. No. The world to come is going to come with a lot of power and glory for us. Nothing is going to preserve us like the presence. Nothing is going to preserve us in the earth to come like the anointing of the spirit. And God said it's in the mystery of a reformed spirit. That man which is able to see in the spirit realm what not many people are able to see concerning the will and purpose of God. The unique things that are hidden from many will open. You see, the spirit of revelation comes as a manifestation of that reformation. You see what I'm saying? So revelation is not just that thing you use on Sunday or Tuesday or Wednesday because you are called to preach. Huh? No, I'm not preaching because I was called here to preach. I'm preaching out of the abundance of an experience that has walked with God since I was eight years old. I know him. I've tested him. I touched him. I felt him. I know who God is. You see what I'm saying? But you see, when they thought that this generation is lost, they're about to be shocked. When they thought that our generation was gone, they're about to be amazed at what God is going to do in our times. I want you to open your mouth and speak to God. <laughs>